Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and a very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks. And this week, a guitar with one hell of a story Mark Boland's Les Paul. And when Gibson decided to release a Mark Boland signature Les Paul, I can't say whoever at Gibson had the final say on the specs of that guitar had a particularly enviable task, at least in regard to nailing its authenticity. First and foremost, the original guitar was nowhere to be seen, at least at that point, having been stolen from outside a London rehearsal studio way back in late 1976. Coupled that with the fact that despite the massive success of Ride the White Swan and the ensuing T-Rextasy, to this day, nobody can really say with any degree of certainty what that guitar was or is. To add to the confusion, it was also renecked at least three times that we know of. Now, despite all of this ambiguity and speculation, Gibson decided to release the Mark Bowen signature Les Paul in 2011, limited to 100 hand-aged models and 350 VOS models. And it's one of those VOS models that I'm lucky enough to have here with me today, very kindly on loan from a friend of mine. So, what is it? Now, while the specs of the signature guitar are relatively straightforward, a Les Paul standard body and a Les Paul custom neck, the same definitely can't be said for the original. Now, it's believed that it started life as a 1959 Les Paul standard. There's been a degree of speculation that it may have been a 58 on account of the plain top, but assuming that Zebra neck pickup is original to the guitar, that at least puts it at either 1959 or 1960, as those pickups are pretty much exclusive to those years. So again, there's also been a degree of speculation that it may have been a 57 gold top, but the centre seam, at least to me, suggests that it was probably a Sunburst Les Paul to start off with. Now, what Whatever the reality, one thing we can say with some degree of certainty is that its original finish was stripped by Mark himself and stained orange in an attempt to make it look closer to his hero, Eddie Cochran's Gretsch. It's in this guise we first see the guitar in 1970, Mark having bought the guitar that very same year apparently, pictured on the front cover of their eponymous debut record, T-Rex. Of course there had been four records prior to that, a psychedelic folk duo Tyrannosaurus Rex, but with a new direction came a new abbreviated name. Now you can see on that front cover, notice the trapezoid inlays and the snake bites, remnants of a once fitted Bigsby. Fast forward to April of 1971 and disillusioned by the apathetic response of the American audiences, Mark threw that guitar across the stage lamenting in a later interview that he'd just broken the most valuable thing that he owned, having snapped the neck clean in two. Now this is where things get a little bit confusing. Next time we see the guitar, understandably it has a replacement neck, and I guess you'd be forgiven for thinking at first glance that it was taken from a less poor custom, on account of the block oblong inlays, but lack of the split diamond inlay on the headstock, it's more of a standard style headstock in fact, makes it a little bit tricky to try and place definitively what it may be, the most prevalent theory being here that it may well have been a less poor copy neck taken from a Japanese import copy that were becoming fairly rife in the UK at the time. 
Either way, we don't need to worry about it for particularly long because by the time that you see the guitar in April of 1972, being used to film Born to Boogie at the Empire Pool at Wembley, we have a new neck, this time with trapezoid standard style inlays, standard style headstock, particularly notable for the lack of a 21st fret marker, rather unusually. Again, this wouldn't last long, however, apparently plagued by tuning and stability issues because by June of 1972, that very same year, we have another new neck. Arguably its most famous, this time definitely taken from a Les Paul Custom. Looking at the shape of the lute on the back of the neck, I would say 1970-1971, although it's hard to definitively place. Either way, it's in this guise, as I said, arguably its most famous, that Gibson chose to reissue it. <laughs> Of course, Mark Boland's life would be cut tragically short in a car accident in September of 1977, but as I said earlier, not before his guitar was actually stolen from him in late 1976. However, in a rather cool conclusion to the story, some 38 years later, that guitar would be unearthed. Bizarrely, of all the places, on a My Less Paul forum online. A thread started by someone initially looking to identify just an old Les Paul. Turns out it's Mark's, and it's located here in the UK, in Essex, having been bought by the poster's father way back in the 90s. It's been refinished, and you guessed it, has another new neck. I guess why someone would refinish and re-neck such an iconic Les Paul is anyone's guess, but in the years that followed not only his death, but the theft of that guitar, it's probably safe to assume that it was fairly hot, so it may have been an attempt to disguise its identity. Either way, that thread is a fascinating read, so I'll link it down in the description box, should you want to check it out. And there you have it. Bit of a shorter episode from me this week, I'm afraid, and a little bit of a selfish one, if I'm entirely honest. I've always been super intrigued by Mark Boland's Les Paul. It's identity, I guess it's probably the most famous hybrid Les Paul out there. It's a true amalgamation of various bits and bobs. And having this beautiful reissue in my possession, albeit for a few days, it's really given me a chance to do a little bit of amateur sleuthing. As ever, I'm Chris Buck. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe with the bell icon if you haven't already. I'm going to play you out now, and I shall see you next week for another episode of Friday Fretworks. Cheers, guys. Take care. See you soon. Yeah.